QuickBooks Online, report formatting basics. Get ready to start moving on up with QuickBooks Online. We're gonna be using the free QuickBooks Online test drive searching in our online search engine for QuickBooks Online test drive, selecting the option that has Intuit.com in it, Intuit being the owner of QuickBooks. We're gonna be using the United States version of the software and verify that we're not a robot. Holding down control, scrolling up a bit. We're currently at 125% on the zoom in. Selecting the cog dropdown, noting we're in the accountant view as opposed to the business view. We're gonna duplicate some tabs to put reports in as we do every time. Right click in the tab up top to duplicate it. Right click in the duplicated tab to duplicate it again. Back to the tab to the left so we can go to the reports on the bottom left and open the balance sheet as that is thinking. Back to the tab to the right, reports on the left. This time, profit and loss, the P to the L, the income statement, closing the hamburger, the hamburgy range to change. 010122 tab 123122 tab run it because we want to refresh it and that's how you do it you run it to refresh it tap to the left close the hand boogie scrolling to the top changing the range from 010122 tab 123122 tab and run it to refresh it I'm going to zoom in a little bit more. Support accounting instruction by clicking the link below, giving you a free month membership to all of the content on our website, broken out by category, further broken out by course. Each course then organized in a logical, reasonable fashion, making it much more easy to find what you need than can be done on a YouTube page. We also include added resources such as Excel practice problems, PDF files, and more like QuickBooks backup files when applicable. So once again, click the link below for a free month membership to our website and all the content on it. So last time we took a look at the balance sheet in general, remembering that the balance sheet and income statement are our major two financial statement reports. Now we wanna take a look at some of the formatting options that we have up top. We have more formatting options in the customize option here. We're mainly gonna be looking at the items which are in, I'd say like the ribbon, and then we'll get into the customized options a little bit more in future presentations. Now note that these customized options are applicable to many different types of reports. So we won't go through all the customizations for different uh, reports. We might try to point out where they, they might differ from report to report. The main thing that you want to understand, however, is that we have reports that are like the balance sheet and the balance sheet represents where we stand as of a certain point in time. You can tell by the date here where it says as of December 31st. And then we have other reports. If I go over to the income statement, like the income statement, which have a time frame. These are performance reports. These are measuring how we did over a certain time range. You need a range in order to see how far you went from one point to the other point. So those are one of the big differences that, that'll change how some of the functionality of uh, the options up top will work. Back to the tab to the left. Also note that uh, some of these changes are, we can actually think of as creating new reports. And that will often take the place uh, or take place when we're doing comparative reports. So we can compare one period to another period. We can then take the difference between the two periods. We can have three periods. We can have multiple months and so on and so forth. We can compare to the prior year. We can have a percentage uh, kind of uh, column as well. And some of these other reports are actually in, as we saw in a prior presentation, the report center. But if you know how to create the reports from the standard balance sheet and income statement, these comparative reports, then you have a lot more flexibility and you won't be as overwhelmed when looking at some of the other reports and the sheer quantity of reports that sometimes they put into the report center. Okay, let's go through it up top. Balance sheet, so we've got the dates. We can choose a custom date, so that'll automatically change the ranges up top. So we've got today, this week, this year, this month, 
uh, this month to date, this year to date. Now, normally, if you're working in real time, it's going to be pulling up like the year to date generally as your as your kind of default, and then you can change it if you want. We have been changing it manually every time because we're working in a practice problem and therefore not in real time. So it's often required for us to change the date range. But you have the, the custom date range here or the default. Now note that you might be asking, why, why does it even have a range? Because if I look at a balance sheet report, it's gonna be the same as long as I have one date. I only need a point in time. I don't need a range in other words. So for example, this 2001 will not change if I change this beginning date to 11 uh, 01 -01 Now it's only a couple months, but it still hasn't changed this 2011. If I change it back from to 010122 and run it, so we're still at 2001. So why do I have that beginning point? Well, one reason is that when you double click or drill down on the data, that's going to take you to a transaction report. And QuickBooks is quite good. Some accounting software will kind of take you to the transaction report, just give you a year's worth of data, no matter what your date range is on the balance sheet. But QuickBooks will, will kind of vary your transaction report based on your range. So instead of having to change the range here, because now I am in a report, that is a timing report. This is showing me how many transactions have happened from January to December and the beginning balances before that point. So if I was to go back and change this date range up here to, to 110122 and then run it, that's gonna give me more refined data as I drill down on the balance sheet to the data it starts at 11. And so now I have a lot less details that I can sort through. So it's actually quite nice and that's a really nice feature within QuickBooks that they do better, I think, than uh, other accounting software oftentimes. So scrolling back up, there's our date ranges. And then we've got the uh, display columns down below. So typically you're looking at the totals when you're looking at a, a normal balance sheet because you're, you're looking at a balance sheet as of a point in time. You have your total column, but you can break it out. Uh, and this is one way you could do those comparative reports. Let's start like by quarter. So I could go by quarter and then run it to refresh it. And so now you've got your balance sheet by quarter. I kind of stuttered there because I didn't change the date. Let's change this date back to 010122 and then run it by quarter. So now you've got your, your four quarters. So you can think of this as a whole nother report, right? Because now you've got kind of like a comparative report or a balance sheet by quarter report or whatever you want to call it. You can then change the name and whatnot up top to, to accompany the, the, the change to the balance sheet, right? You can change the title uh, to change that name. So you can do the same thing. Uh, you might see it like on a month by month comparison, run it. This would be fairly long if you do each month of the year, but if you only had a couple months, it might be useful. Notice that these comparative reports are useful, but they're not, sh they're not performance reports. Sometimes these kind of reports are more useful on the profit and loss because then you're measuring performance. Remember, we're measuring on a balance sheet where we stand as of a point in time. Also, just to point out, if I was to say, let's say, let's say we go back to, I, I could try to go uh, years here and then maybe I go from January to 2023. So now I've got a couple, I've got two years. So that's another way you can do like a, a year by year comparison. Notice if I if I do the if I go back to the quarters, let's say, and then I change this to twelve thirty one two two and run it, and I compare that to what happens on the income statement. If I do the same thing, if I make this go to quarters, and uh, everything else looks good, on the income statement I've got my four quarters and then a total column because it's summing up the four quarters. We don't have that same total column on the balance sheet because of the difference between the type of reports. These are reporting where we stand at any given time. The income statement is adding then the, the total, which is giving you where you, what we earned over that time range and then over the total time range of the four quarters. Okay, let's bring it back to the total here and run it again. So then if I select this dropdown, we've got our options of the rows and the, and the columns. Now, typically, we're, we're focusing in, in on the rows here. 
and because we're on a balance sheet, but you can just see the concept in the, in the event that you have a columns to apply it to. Notice it's choosing active rows. So that means that there's been activity happening, you know, in the accounts and that allows you to drill down. Notice that this one has a zero in it. You're like, well, why is it giving me an account that has a zero in it? It's not giving me all the general ledger accounts, meaning if I went to the balance sheet over here, I mean, I went to the tab to the right and went into the accounting and looked at the register. It's not that all my balance sheet accounts are gonna show up on the balance sheet, right? It's only the ones that have, have numbers in them, right? So why, if there's a zero, is this one showing up? It's showing up because it has been active. It's showing up so to allow you from a bookkeeping standpoint to click on it to see the detail. So there's still stuff that happened into it, even though it's cleared back down to zero at that point. That's quite nice as the default option because oftentimes we're using this from an internal purpose perspective to drill back down on the data. Now, if you wanted external reporting, you can get rid of that item with a zero because you don't need it there by selecting the drop down and saying that you want the non-zero items. So get rid of the ones that don't that don't have any data in it. So now that one has, oh, hold on a sec, it didn't disappear, run it. There it is. So now it disappeared. So now it's gone. And then if you want to look at all the accounts, which you typically wouldn't want, but it might be useful just to see all the accounts that are not being used if you want to clean up your, G your GL, for example. So now you've got these accounts with actual blank amounts in them because you haven't been using them. That might be a good way for you to, to kind of see which accounts are not being used so that you can maybe make them inactive if you don't believe you're going to use them in the future. All right, we'll hit the drop down. So active is the default and it's a good default typically. And then we've got up top, we've got the select of the period. So this, this is here, we've got the previous period, uh, previous year, and then the percentage of row and percentage of column. So this is another way to do a comparative report and, and it does it a little bit differently. So just recall that when I did this comparative, if I say quarter by quarter and run it, so now you've got you've got the beginning the, the oldest quarter to the newest quarter, quarter reading in time left to right now if i did back to the total uh only and i wanted to do a comparison uh this way to a previous period notice i can only compare like two periods i can't really compare four periods i'm going to compare one to the other and i'm going to have the most recent period first so how would that work well, if you did that on a year's on, on, let's say a month, let's say I go from 120122 to 123122. And then I say, select the previous period. And so this is if you want a custom date range, this is going from 111 to 1130. Notice it gets a little bit tricky when you pick the previous period because some months have 31 days versus 30 days and so on. If you want a month by month comparison, then typically you're gonna want you know, to have the full month, even though it's a little bit different in terms of the number of days. So let's run the report, run it. So now we've got uh, December 1st and November on the second column. So you have the most current month first, which is quite common in a, a type of comparison. So then the other thing that's quite common is to say, if you're having a side-by-side -side comparison, add the dollar change. Show me the difference between the two, running it, running it. And so now you've got December, November, and the change between the two. So this is another format of a report. You can think of it as a whole kind of another report. You're comparing one period to another period. And then you might have the percentage change. So I can say, add the percentage change, percentage change, often confuses people at first that, you know, percentage can, percentages can be kind of uh, intimidating, but it's quite useful for a horizontal analysis to take the current period, for example, 5281.52 minus the 4865.29 gives us the dollar change. But if I wanna compare it to another business, if I'm benchmarking, then I can't really compare it to another business that's bigger than me, which is what I often want to do because I'm trying to improve to be as big as they are. So then I then I have to compare it. So I have to com compare the, the percent. So I can take that and look at the percentage of the prior period dividing by 4865.29. So that's my percentage increase. If I move the decimal two places over 8.56. So anytime we measure performance, 
the percentage is quite useful. Anytime you measure performance in a job, which we can see in athletic jobs, uh, athletes, for example, obviously baseball players and whatnot, we try to look at their percentages because that's how we have to do it when you have different at-bats, for example, and you're trying to measure batting averages and whatnot. So that's gonna be that one. If I hit the drop down, you, you could do this uh, with, with a different period. So if I was to pick the quarter, a quarter by quarter comparison, the last quarter starts at 10.0122. So October, November, December. Uh, I'm Hold on a sec, let me do it up here. I can do it up here. The last quarter starts at 10.0122 uh, and to 12.31. And then if I said I want the previous period now, then it's gonna pick in essence the prior quarter and if I run that, now we've got, in essence, as of December, as of uh, September, which it's the quarter ended. If it was a performance report over here, we'd have the performance over the three quarters. We'll talk, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, but so, and then we can have the change and so on where we stand. So that is that one. So let's undo that and let's, let's run it again. Let's bring us back to the baseline, which is 010122 to 123122 and run it again and then i hit the drop down we've got the previous year to date now you can imagine using this one to kind of do the previous year but but this one will give you you know a, a previous year to date comparison so if i select the previous year to date i can run it and so so now we've got uh as of december as of december because it's as, as of a point in time if i changed this from january to to uh, let's say endpoint 10, 31, 2, 2, and run it. So now you've got October to October. So it's taken the year to date. Again, the, the terminology on the year to date kind of uh, implies like a performance report, like an income statement. So when we go to the income statement, it'll have the year to date up to October, right? For for the current year and the prior year but now we're as of a point in time because it's a balance sheet and then if i hit the drop down and i can do the percent and and change this way again with that so another comparative report so if you think about these comparative reports we'll dive into building them more and analyze them more later but just note you've got a whole lot of comparisons now if you're trying to think about how you're going to be reporting these reports to like a supervisor You've got a standard balance sheet. You've got a summarized balance sheet. You've got a comparative balance sheet month by month. You've got a three month comparison, a year to date month comparison, a quarter by quarter comparison, a current quarter to the prior quarter comparison, a current quarter to the prior quarter, right? Difference. And so, so you could come up with, in essence, infinite reports starting to compare different periods uh, with, with just the balance sheet. So that's why the reports can get quite overwhelming even though they're pulling from, in essence, the same data. So I hit the drop down again. I'm gonna undo that one. Let's take us back to the baseline and adjust the range to 123122 back to the normal. And then if I hit the drop down, we've got the percent of rows and percent of columns. Now, typically we're looking percent of columns with the format of, of this report. So that's the one I will uh, choose. And we're gonna run it. So if I run it, then now we've got our percentages again, but it's a little bit different format of the percentages. So now you've got, now you've got your percentage on comparing to the total. So this would be kind of like an investment portfolio. You're comparing to your total assets. So you've got your check, your cash here, uh, or your checking accounts at least, not including undeposited funds. One oh oh two divided by the total, uh, the total assets which are down here 23 divided by 23, 436.29 is uh, point, or point oh 0.08 or 8.54 about if you move the decimal over. So that gives you a, a comparison. And again, we can compare that to other companies and say how much money in terms of percentage of total assets do they have? And this gets a little bit into kind of ratio analysis to help us to kind of benchmark to other companies how much percentage receivables do they have to their total assets is that comparable to me i can't compare the dollar amount because they're bigger than i am but maybe i can compare, compare the percentage maybe that'll give me some information that's meaningful to help me and then on the liabilities same thing comparing to total 
uh, liabilities and equity, uh, which is the same as the total assets. So, so you can create a pie, you know, think of it like a pie chart kind of allocation for your investment por portfolio uh, type of thing, similar kind of process. So let's go back then. And, and again, now you can do a column comparison and try to do a previous period comparison, right? So, so you can start to, you can mix and match these up you know, in different, in different formats, possibly, uh, there's no data in this one in that case, but, but again, that once you start mixing and matching this stuff up, you can imagine having a whole lot of different reports and we'll dive into more of them in the future. So let's go ahead and run this again, back to our baseline. I'm going to undo this and go back to our normal report. And then we've got the accrual basis versus the cashed basis. Now accrual is what you typically want by default on the report. And the reason is because uh, if you're on a cashed basis, you, it doesn't mean that you're gonna just click over to the cashed basis and now you run on a cash basis. It's gonna be dependent on the type of industry that you're in and what forms you're using. So for example, if I go on over to my flow chart, we've talked about before, you can think about accrual or cashed basis in terms of cycle. And you might be like on an accrual basis for the, for the vendor cycle, but not the customer cycle or vice versa. So for example, if you're, if you're, if you're paying on the money going outside of things for goods and services, you're purchasing a lot of small businesses might be in essence on a cashed basis as they pay for stuff, just as they become due possibly with the bank feeds creating in essence a check or expense type form uh, instead of entering a bill which would be an accrual component but maybe they're on an accrual system for the for the for the sales side because they're in a type of industry where they have to send out invoices and track the accounts receivable so it's just dependent on the industry if you're on the sale on the on the sales side or revenue side maybe you're in a system where where you're at a gig work and you're just getting paid through the deposits and recording the deposits as they come through, through the bank feeds and recording revenue that way. In that case, you're basically on a cash-based system, or you might be on a cash-based system where you sell at a cash register at a food truck or something like that, where you get paid at the same point in time, you do the work or provide the inventory, but you also might have to be in an industry where you're in landscaping, bookkeeping, law, where you have to invoice the client and track the accounts receivable. That means this form is an accrual form. If you're going to record it and track the accounts receivable, it's going to record accounts receivable, which is an accrual account. So no, you don't have to, if, if you're not on an accrual system, if you're on a cash based system, you don't, you just start using the deposit form and the check forms, your bank account forms, your bank feeds are going to be your primary transactions. If that's the case, you're already on a cash based system. You don't need to toggle to the cash based system because you're already on it. If you're using an accrual based system, then you're going to want the accounts receivable account, which is an accrual account because, because you have to track the accounts receivable. So why would they have this toggle up top? It's kind of neat to use if you know what you're doing with it, right? Because now I can say, okay, what if I was to go from accrual to cashed? What would that do? If, well, if I'm using account receivable to record the sales, then if I switch that over to a cash based system, it shouldn't record the sales or the revenue here, it should record the revenue when I receive the payment, meaning accounts receivable should go away. Now it's not perfect, because I think the inventory kind of messes things up. But you would think if I toggled over to here, you would remove the accounts receivable because that's an accrual account, you might even think it would, should remove entirely the fixed asset account, you know, because that's an accrual kind of thing as well. And you would think that it would uh, remove the accounts payable account. So let's toggle it over and run it. And so now you've got uh, your, your accounts receivable is gone, right? So that makes sense because that's an accrual account and accounts payable is gone. So now you can kind of see your books on a cash based system. So that's kind of nice to look at look at it from a cash flow perspective it's kind of like it's kind of like looking at a statement of cash flows except this is the balance sheet if you did that to the income statement so it's it can have its uses but what i what you don't want to think of it as is that in order to be in a cash based system you just toggle this thing over to cash based system no 
it's it's just changing when the revenue recognition happens but you don't want to have that as your driving principle okay that's enough of that so then you've got your collapse column up here i'm looking at these items so you could collapse and so if you had a lot of like sub accounts then it would collapse the sub accounts on them so these triangles you'll re recall could either be due to the financial account uh grouping like an asset and current assets or just common financial account groups or they can be due to an account type which is here so that's an account type driven by what kind of gl account it is or you can make a sub account which we see more on like the 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 income statement these sub accounts so this would collapse the triangles that are the sub accounts which we don't have much at this point on the balance sheet it's more clearly seen on the income statement let's just jump over there real quick to show it so if i went to the income statement and collapse so now you've collapsed all those sub account ones if i expand it you've got a much longer statement so so it'll be significant if you use a lot of sub accounts and then you got the sort drop down you've got this default sorting uh total in ascending order so if i say i want to see the total in ascending order and run it so now uh and you've you've got you've got the savings account and then the checking account within this category it might be better to do total and descending order and run it so so now if i go into some of these accounts like like this one right here other current assets it it would normally have within this category defaulted to the the uh, alphabetical order this one first but now it's putting the higher dollar amount one first which is useful because that might be the way that you want to normally be presenting the data like within each category so how is this being sorted it's being sorted by account type assets liabilities equity and then bank account liquid assets accounts receivable and then within each category typically by alphabetical order but now we switched it to the dollar amount meaning the most important one kind of is on top the other way you can do that kind of formatting is to use account numbers account numbers can be a little bit tricky though because you want to make sure that you're, you're using the right technique of having account numbers or else your account numbers will get all messed up uh we'll, we'll have a i think we have a section just to give an outline on account numbers if you're interested in in looking at them but by default they don't have the account numbers on so down here this one's out of order in terms of alphabetical order but makes sense in terms of the dollar amount within that category so it's not a perfect system uh but it can give you a night it's a it could be a useful thing so i'm going to go back to the default and run it again and so now if i go down here uh to to where was that under see now this unearned is below this one because it's in alphabetical order within that category okay so you could add notes so this gives you your little notes item that you can add on it and then uh, edit the titles. This allows you to jump right into the titles. Now, this is kind of neat. Uh, and I haven't used it a lot, but it's it's kind of an interesting component because notice that these, these titles right here, you can't really change because that is just a normal a title that they're using. This is a normal financial title, but it's usually static. These are driven by the fact that you had the account type the, the gl account types are driving these so usually you couldn't you can't change them because they're stuck there and then you've got this equity section which usually is called owner's equity if it's a sole proprietorship stockholders equity if it's a corporation and then partners equity if it's a it's a partnership so you might want to change those and they give you this uh edit titles which possibly could allow you to do that so if i so you've got your current assets your bank accounts you might call this something like cash right and you might call you might call your fixed assets like prop property plant uh, and equipment that might be the title that you prefer you know there and then you might call your equity like owners which i'm not sure where the comma goes i get it mixed up all the time owners or the whatever you know what i'm talking about that little thing and then retained earnings and and uh net income so you might change retained earnings. but i'm going to save it 
and then this could take a minute so i it might take a while to kind of refresh those but it would be kind of nice to do that and then maybe you can save the reports so that you have the external reporting with those terms that are that are useful for external reporting if they're if they're going to be preferred terms because the balance sheet as we saw when we looked at the balance sheet is not really optimized for external reporting just exactly like you would expect from like a like a reviewed financial statement because it's using these techniques that are helping you for for the internal bookkeeping use of it but the more you can do to to make it designed for external reporting just right out of the box uh is is good and then anything you can't do you can you can export it to excel and adjust for example so then we can we can also adjust the title here we can adjust the title here so if i changed it to a comparative balance sheet as we'll do in the future we can adjust the name of it and then we've we can email it out which we'll talk more about how to send it to people and we can print it and and we can we also have the the preview here so you can see what it's going to look like as printed and then you can also uh export it so if you have excel you can export it we'll talk more about how to use excel and the exporting feature so that we can get all a bunch of reports possibly on one pdf with the use of excel exporting and a, a pdf printer and then you've got your cog drop down for the display uh, density of a compact option so those are the general kind of uh, editing components we'll go into some of the customization options a bit more in a future presentation uh, i don't think i did anything different in terms of the of the cog drop down in the business view We've just been working in the reports and the chart of accounts. So if I look at the business view, the, the reports are just in bookkeeping. And then, I'm sorry, this is the chart of accounts in bookkeeping and the chart of accounts under manage. And then the reports are under business overview and reports.